So we are in a series here at Northern, looking at the Gospel of Mark. And as we read through the biography of Jesus' life that's recorded for us, we're diving deeper into the text, into the words and the context in order to learn more deeply together. And so this morning we're coming to a very familiar passage, this one that Amy read for us, Mark 4, 35 to 41, when Jesus calms the storm. So if you've been following Jesus for a while, or if you've just walked in here this morning, or you've joined online, um, and you, or you've not encountered Jesus all that much at all, <clears throat> you might still have heard this story. Along with Jesus walking on water and feeding the 5,000, this is one of those miraculous episodes that's captured for us by the Gospel writers. And three out of four of the Gospels record this story for us in very similar ways. I'm just going to show you Luke um, 8, 22 to 25, and Matthew 8, 23 to 27. It's the same, same story. It's really similar. <clears throat> I'm going to leave that up there for you to look at and keep in mind what Amy's already read to us. There's some core pieces to this story. Jesus is in the boat with the disciples. The storm comes up quickly and the experienced fishermen who are in the boat are afraid for their lives. They think that they might drown. Jesus is asleep. So they wake Jesus. And the disciples are horrified. How could Jesus possibly be asleep at a time like this? Jesus tells the wind and the waves to calm down and nature responds. They do. <clears throat> Jesus seems to scold the disciples and the disciples are amazed. This action has extended their vision of who Jesus is. It's kind of the core, the core parts of this story as it's recorded for us. So we're going to walk through these elements together this morning, focusing on the account that we find in Mark. I want to show you these other versions, though, <coughs> because these stories has, this story has been included by each of these writers for a reason. This is an important story. The story actually starts a little bit before this episode, though. <coughs> At the beginning of the verse that Amy read for us is the phrase, as evening came. So when we look back, that day started at the beginning of what we know as chapter 4. So if you have a Bible with you on your phone or your iPad, or you can take a look at that if you like. If you don't, that's okay. I'm going to give you the summary version. This is the Sam summary, so I encourage you to go home and read it and you can <laughs> make your own summary. So Jesus starts the day by walking down to the edge of the lake where he found the crowd or they found him and he sat down and he taught them. He taught them about the parable of the sower, actually. And then um, he has some questions from the disciples. They don't quite understand what he's talking about, so he explains it to them in depth. And then he um, goes on to give them more stories and more teaching about how to understand the kingdom of God. Presenting to a crowd is tiring, <laughs> she says from the front of the room. But fielding questions and responding, speaking loudly enough to be heard... And for Jesus, we know that by this time in his ministry, word had got out about his capacity to heal. So there would no doubt be people in, in the crowd waiting there for a word or a touch from him. And then he unpacks all the detail by mentoring 12 men. So just a quiet day. I think Jesus is tired. I think he needs a break. So here is when he suggests to them that they go on a boat to the other side of the lake. And this is where we find the passage that we come to this morning. Um, on Thursday afternoon here, we had a storm. I don't know where you were, but for me, it had been a bit windy and there'd been um, some clouds rolling in, but I was not expecting the kind of storm that we ended up having. I was picking up Elizabeth at 4.30 in the afternoon from childcare, and when I walked into childcare, it wasn't raining. There was even a little bit of sun visible. I wasn't all that long inside, I promise. But when I came out, it began to rain lightly. And by the time that we were halfway home, the rain was so heavy that it was difficult to see. And Lizzie got out and just getting from the car to the house, which is a metre and a half, <laughs> we got really wet. <clears throat> I had the safety of a car and a house. If I had been outside in that weather, it would be intense. And the disciples are in this kind of a storm, but much worse. It came up so quickly and it was so intense. Not only did they not have the protection of 
um, a house or a car, but they're even more vulnerable by being out in the water. The waves are coming up over the side of the boat and the boat is flooding. Some of these guys are fishermen. They, they know what this means. They know what it looks like. It's a great storm. It's powerful and overwhelming. Some of the disciples, they know boats. They know water. But they are not calm in this situation. They're stressed. I think it's probably a little bit lightly. They're stressed. So where's Jesus? Kind of <laughs> He's asleep. The disciples cannot comprehend how Jesus could be asleep at a time like this. I just want to pause there for a moment. I kind of use that phrase, at a time like this. Because I think for us, we often think, where is God? Where is Jesus right now? How come he didn't show up for me at a time like this when I needed him? Have you ever felt like maybe Jesus doesn't care for you? That's what the disciples ask him. Don't you care that we're about to drown? We heard this morning that there are lots of different ways that people show care. Um, You know, big. we had some kind of bigger stories, but also there are little things. Just when someone, you know, sends you a card or gives you a hug, does the washing up, care looks really different the way that we receive it, but also the way that people show it. Anyway, this is where the disciples are at. They know that they have Jesus there with them in the boat and they're in trouble. Why doesn't Jesus do something? They have an assumption. They say, don't you care if we drown? They have an assumption about how care should look right now in this moment we make assumptions about what care looks like too about how others should show care or how about how god is demonstrating care to us so jesus is sleeping and we don't really know why and i'm not really sure how it's possible except to say that we do sleep through things that happen in the world there was an earthquake in melbourne in 2021 do people remember that (laughs) <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did anyone not notice that that happened? Okay, Elizabeth slept through it. Um, so, <laughs> uh, when I was in California, when I was little, we regularly had um, tremors and earthquakes. My brother always slept through them. People, you know, sleep is a funny thing. <clears throat> for whatever reason, Jesus does not wake up for the storm. And the point of the story here isn't that Jesus is asleep. It's that he's able to calm the storm. So I think we have lots of questions about why Jesus is sleeping. And I have to say, when I read this passage, I'm like, what is, what is that about? But we need to shift our focus. Jesus is able to calm the storm. As I was putting this message together this week, um, something stood out to me in this passage. Jesus calms the storm. And the disciples are amazed. They weren't expecting him to do that. But they did ask for help. So what were they hoping for? Did they think that the carpenter might help them row to shore? Did they think that the carpenter might have some wisdom that the seasoned sailors among them didn't? The disciples come to Jesus and they say, don't you care, do something. How often... Do we cry out to Jesus in this way? A fair amount would be my guess. But what are we expecting? Are we looking for him to act and to care for us in kind of unexpected ways? Or have we decided how Jesus should answer our prayer? And this is the first thing that I wanted us to reflect on this morning. Think about the way that you pray. When you bring something before God, Have you decided how it should be sorted out? This is tricky because God's word encourages us to ask for what we need and to bring out the desires of our heart to God. That prayer does matter to God. That it does make a difference. But God's word is also very clear that it is God who answers prayer 
and God who shapes the desires of our heart. God is God and we are not. So Jesus acts. He does something. And his action is to rebuke the wind and the waves. And that word rebuke um, is the same word that Mark uses elsewhere to talk about rebuking ungodly spirits and to rebuke people who are taking action (coughs) or providing wisdom that isn't of God. I don't think that Mark is trying to say that the storm is ungodly. I think the action that Jesus takes is the same. What we see through Mark's storytelling is a Jesus who has authority. He has authority over spirits. He has authority over teaching. And he has authority over nature. He just tells them to stop. This storm is a great storm. In all the versions of this story, the writers are clear that the storm is immense and powerful and the boat and the people are being overwhelmed by it. Jesus, though, is greater than the storm. He not only stops the ferocity of the storm, but he dismisses it completely. The great storm is replaced by a great calm. And this is the second thing for us to reflect on this morning. Jesus has power over the wildest experiences in nature. God is big, really big. We sometimes need reminding of how great God is. Sometimes when we pray or when we go about our lives, we don't really believe that God is able. And this story reminds us, God is able, really able. Calming the greatest storm, no problem. So coming back to our story, this is something that I always find interesting about this story. Jesus seems to kind of scold the disciples. And throughout the Gospel of Mark, we'll keep seeing it, so look out for it as we're going through this series, the lack of understanding of the disciples is kind of a regular theme in in the book of Mark. And Jesus says to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? It it always, to me, has sounded a bit harsh. The storm was intense. It's understandable that they are scared and they come to Jesus to ask for help. Isn't that a good thing? So there's two things about this, I think. The first is the tone that we read into this question or that I've read into this question that is perhaps not there. Um, When I first read this story, I think that Jesus is exasperated with them. But when we read it with different expression, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? Why are they afraid? Because the storm is great. They have not understood that they have Jesus in the boat. And he's greater than the storm. They do not need to fear the storm. Now, this is not a, an allegory, which is like a fancy word for saying that, um, you know, we can put us and God into this story. The idea 